Well, I'm Ruben Gutman, and I'm here with Joe Carroll Nesset Sale, who is a faculty member of the Kessler Eidson Trial Techniques Program at Emory University School of Law. And thank you for being here with me today. My pleasure. You know, we have a lot of faculty members who, of course, are uh, established lawyers, uh, prominent lawyers in their field. And, of course, you're one of them. But there's something else about you um, that we want to talk about, uh, along with your law career. And that is the fact that, in addition to being a lawyer, you are, were at one time not just a client, but a prominent client. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But um, as a lead up to that, let me start off by asking you this question. You were not always a lawyer. That's true. And how, what were you doing uh, 40 years ago, 35 years ago? I was a teacher in an inner city junior high in Cleveland, Ohio. I had a master's degree in teaching focusing on inner city education. And what happened to you when you were teaching? Well, when I was teaching and I was married, um, I became pregnant along the way. And I learned from the administration that I could not complete my school year. Uh, this was in February or so that I learned my son was due to be born in July. So I intended to teach through June and was told that I could not do so. And do you remember the year? Yes, it was 1971. Wow. And what happened? Well, I initially uh, went to the union chairman in my building. I complained, and he said, Ms. LaFleur, just go home and have the baby. That's what people do. I said, I don't knit. I don't crochet. I teach. I got no help. So I did what I thought the wise next step was. I got on the phone and called the ACLU. I believe those were the folks who would advocate for someone like me. I've tried repeatedly to have them help me, and the response was, Ms. LaFleur, we have too many other important cases going on, like whether students can wear black armbands to school. Your case is a loser, and we can't help you. Now, of course, let's go back to that era. This was the height of the Vietnam War. Yes, it was. Right? Civil rights movement going on at the time? Yes. Who was president of the United States back then? Ooh. Was that Gerald Ford? Mm, no, Richard after Nixon back then. Oh, right? it was a Nixon in '71. Right, right. Oh my goodness. Okay. So tell me what happened. What was the next step? I tried to persuade the Board of Education to let me stay, and they said if it were just you, Ms. Lafleur, because you're a wonderful teacher, but it would affect lots of folks. So I called the Cleveland Plain Dealer, Reuben, um, and I said I need the name of a women's lib group, to use the terminology of the day. And I remember the woman in the reference department said, do you have a particular one in mind? And said, I do not know the name. I figured you would know. She gave me a couple of names that she researched, and I began making phone calls. And eventually, a representative would say, we're not the right group, but here's another name. Here's another number. And I eventually, after a few calls, had uh, on the other end of the phone a woman who said, Joe Carroll, I'm going to help you. And it's not going to cost you a penny. And we're going to get to this end of this road together. And I think that road is going to be at the United States Supreme Court. And what happened? Um, they took my case. We initially tried to get an injunction in the federal court in Ohio, and the aging judge said, Ms. LaFleur will get exactly what she deserves, and she doesn't deserve an injunction. They took me out of the classroom after that, and for two weeks I showed up and told my principal, I'm ready to teach. And uh, he said, Ms. LaFleur, you need to leave the building. You can't be here. Now, Reuben, it was odd because pregnant students were allowed to stay in the classroom. I taught seventh graders, eighth graders, ninth graders who were pregnant. We got to talk prenatal care. They were planning my shower, but I was deemed not appropriate for the classroom. Interestingly, you could stay the first four months of your pregnancy, but at the moment you began to appear to be pregnant, I think you became an embarrassment or you began to be a person who actually had a sexual nature and they no, want, no longer wanted you in the public schools. And you'd been teaching there for how long? That was my second or third year, mm -hmm. my, my second full year at that school. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with that? You know, you're 
you're told that you can't go to this place that you work at, this place that you love. You had a great relationship with the students. They were prepared for your baby to arrive. They would have done a shower for you. And you're told you can't come to work anymore. What was that like? It was really horrible. I remember telling my students, I am not going to tell you goodbye because that means I accept that a day will come when I will not be here with you. I'm not giving up. And eventually, of course, I just couldn't appear. I remember saying to, thinking to myself and saying to others, I can't believe this is happening. This is discrimination. I know discrimination. It's what happened to the Jews in World War II. I grew up in the segregated Richmond, Virginia area during the 50s and 60s. I knew that it was blacks who were fell victims of discrimination. It was not a sweet, white young woman like me that was the victim of discrimination. And it felt awful. And for the first time, I had a, an inkling of what it would be like to suffer those, what I viewed as much greater discriminations. Now, you're sitting in federal court. Yes. Right? And um, a United States District Court judge, appointed by the President of the United States, says to you, Miss LaFleur, and that was your name at the time, you're going to get exactly what you deserve? Yes, he did. And those are the words you remember? Absolutely. Right. And, and how did you feel when you heard that? I felt awful. I had a legal team with me of wonderful lawyers. They had to bench try this case to the same judge who said we would get what we deserved. And so I felt bad for them to see such talented lawyers work so hard. But I saw in my lawyers a determination that even if the trial court decision went against us, as it most certainly was going to, these were folks who were going to not give up on me and not give up on the right to vindicate the working right of, of pregnant school teachers. OK, so let's walk through the process a little bit. Okay. The first thing you do is you file an injunction in the United States District Court in Cleveland, Ohio? Yes. Okay. And you're asking the court to enjoin the school from um, not allowing you to come to class. True. And the judge then says you're going to get what you deserve, right? Yes. And, but even though you, your injunction was denied, of course, you still had the right to what we call a trial on the merits? Yes, we did. And, and between the time the injunction was denied and the time of the trial, on the merits, how much time elapsed? We tried the case, as I remember, that same year. Was that 1971? 1971. It may have been early into the next year. There certainly was some delay. In the interim, I, f I, um, I was, um, forget that, that's bad. Part of the rule of the Cleveland Board of Education was not only did you have to leave the classroom at four months of pregnancy? You could not return to the classroom until the semester following the 90-day birthday of your child. So for most of us, it meant an entire year that you couldn't teach. Fortunately, during that waiting time when I could not return to Cleveland, I uh, accepted, accepted a job as a substitute teacher after the birth of my child that fall. So I was able, in some capacity, to continue teaching. In a public school? In a public school. Most schools had that same rigid rule. A few did not. And I found a system did, who did not and who welcomed me. OK, so tell me about the bench trial on the merits. And when we say bench trial, we're talking about a trial without a jury, right? That's, yes. Just to a judge. And you're sitting there at counsel's table next to the counsel. Yes. OK. And um, so tell me about that trial and start off by telling me a little bit about your legal team. The head of my legal team was actually a woman named Jane Picker. She was teaching, she was, had worked at a Squire Sanders Dempsey law firm, which happened to be the <laughs> firm representing the Cleveland Board of Education. So as she transitioned to uh, stop her employment there, and to found the women's law firm during this period, she had to act in the back. And I was represented by a man and a woman um, and, a, and an array of law clerks who actually tried the case 
even then it took a team to, to try the case. It was most bizarre. Uh, there was a gentleman representing the school board who was in his 50s, a delightful gentleman, but who called witnesses to testify about and made arguments about the uh, reasonableness of the requirement that pregnant women be required to leave, that, that our center of gravity was so skewed that we would not be able to stand upright, that we could not carry textbooks, that we were vulnerable to being assaulted by students and injured, that it was generally not healthy for us because of the complications of pregnancy that could face us. Our expert was a 90-year-old obstetrician, herself a mother of children, and uh, she talked about how she worked until the day before her children were, was born, that pregnancy was perfectly healthy. Um, but we didn't have a jury to persuade of the righteousness of the cause, and the judge ultimately found against us on the, the facts that I've described, and also the concern by the school board that students would engage in gambling and lotteries as to when my child would be born, and that would be disruptive of the educational process. Wow, I guess, uh, I guess they could do the same with basketball in Ohio, too. I think so, I, do. I certainly do. Let's talk about the preparation for the trial a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, tell me what that was like. Did you work with your legal team in preparing the case? I, I did, I was very curious about this. I had my deposition, of course, taken a, a unique experience. Um, one of the things, by the way, that came out in the trial that sort of related to the preparation was that on cross-examination, I was asked if this was my first child. And I said it was my first child. And at the end of the trial, I remember saying to my lawyer outside, I'm certainly glad he didn't ask me if that was my first pregnancy. Her jaw dropped and she said, what do you mean? And I said, while I was teaching at another school, first grade, I was pregnant, I had a miscarriage. But he would have tried to have said the miscarriage was the result of the teaching, but he didn't ask me that question. And my lawyer was shocked that she didn't know that. And as a client, I said, well, nobody asked me that question. So one of the things I learned is being, be very specific and thorough in the questions I ask clients from that experience. Now, just to be clear, of course, one of the defenses that the school district had, or one of the issues they raised, was that, um, you know, gee, it's rational for us to not allow pregnant women after a certain point in the pregnancy to come to school because there's the risk that they will have a miscarriage and the school could be responsible for it. Was that an argument that was made? They did not because most miscarriages occur during the first trimester when uh, some pregnant women have morning sickness, which I didn't have. So they didn't make that argument. There was no um, withholding of information. And I genuinely believed then that I was not asked a question that, to which I should have answered anything differently. Okay. So we're in 1971, early 1972, when this case is tried to a judge, mm -hmm. the United States District Court in Cleveland, Ohio, and the judge rules against you. And um, you're in a situation where your child, I guess, is now born at the yes. time, right? So you have a, a newborn baby, right? And um, you're working part-time uh, in school districts or systems mm -hmm. that will allow you to work, yes. right? Um, what's your next legal step? Well. My legal team, now headed by Ms. Picker, who took over the appellate representation, <laughs> having started her own firm, she said, Joe Carroll, we appeal. We are not giving up. We believe we are right. Don't worry about it. Of course, this was all very costly. One of the reasons no one had challenged this was because school teachers were not paid enough to take on large organizations like the entire Board of Education. So it was always very heartening to me as a young teacher to know that they weren't going to stop just because they lost the first round. 
And so you go to the United States Court of Appeals, was it the Sixth Circuit? Yes, it? in Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. And tell me about that. That was an exciting day, Reuben. Uh, my husband and I and our young son, who was about a year and a half or so years old at the time of the argument, drove down to Cincinnati. <laughs> we went up in the elevator to the courtroom. In the elevator was a middle-aged gentleman and he chatted with us, just briefly said hello, and we were talking to our son and having a good time. We got off on the same floor. When the panel of judges entered the courtroom, as we entered the courtroom, it turned out that that sweet, kind gentleman in the elevator was Justice Tom Clark, who had been a member of the United States Supreme Court but who had resigned when his son Ramsey was appointed Attorney General of the United States. So we were very pleased that our son was well behaved and we were treating our son with great love and affection and that um, Justice Clark saw that and was now on the panel. And what happened? How did the argument go? Um, one of the ways the, ar the argument was different, of course it was all, there's no testimony, it was all appellate argument, is that we learned that Justice Clark, who had asked to sit on this case, had in his early days been a member of the United Auto Workers. So he had a union background. He was sort of a man of the people. And it, from my perspective as a then school teacher, I just remembered thinking that my side was having all of the rational, logical, reasonable arguments and the arguments that the school board had to make were describing times perhaps that should have been in the 1800s and not in the 1970s in this country. Okay. So you felt good about the argument. I did. And what happened? We won two to one. Tom Clark wrote the opinion. It was great. But of course, along the way in in the Richmond, Virginia area, my hometown, there was another teacher who had filed another lawsuit after us that was trailing ours. My team had loaned her legal team, it's a legal research and briefs, and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals had reached a different decision. Uh, so buttressed by the fact that the school board knew that another circuit had come to its conclusion, the conclusion the Cleveland Board wanted, they filed a petition for certiorari in the United States Supreme Court, so it was not over. Okay, so let's talk about the specific, as we say, legal issues, right? Um, what was the legal issue at play in the Richmond case and in your case in the Sixth Circuit, Lafleur versus uh, the Cleveland Consolidated School District? Right. Well, we were in part relying on a anti-discrimination law from the 1800s, but the primary legal issue advance was the denial of equal protection. We really wanted the Supreme Court to visit that issue in terms of women and men. There was also a violation of due process, that they a clause that they were advancing. Now this was all novel and somewhat incomprehensible to a school teacher um, who was not used to dealing with those kinds of legal principles. Um, and, but the equal protection aspect of this was a primary basis advanced by the lawyers in their briefs when we went to the United States Supreme Court. The right of a pregnant woman to be able to work. Correct. In a school system. Yes. And the problem that a public school system violates the 14th Amendment yes. by discriminating. And one of the examples we would use would be if a male teacher went skiing and broke his leg on the weekend, he would not lose his job even if it took him out of the classroom for several months. Where if a female um, teacher became pregnant and delivered a baby over the weekend, she would lose her job or be placed on mandatory maternity leave. They did not terminate me. They made me take a maternity leave. So there was unequal treatment of men and women 
uh, arising from the need and the right of women to bear children. You know, in some ways you're challenging what at the time was maybe an accepted practice. You're kind of a whistleblower. You ever think of yourself like that? Hmm. I didn't, I didn't think about it that way. I just was, had this stubborn streak, I suppose, uh, perhaps Ruben in large part driven by the fact that the students that I taught in an all-black inner city junior high needed a good teacher. And if they took me out of the classroom for the rest of the year, these students would be disrupted. I believe these students were entitled to the best continuous education they had. Um, and that year, that was me. So I felt badly for my student students. In addition, because this was discrimination, I wanted these African American children to see that no one should tolerate discrimination. And so I wanted if I could get a lawyer to help me, I wanted to model that kind of stubbornness and defiance of that which is accepted, even though it is clearly wrong. Okay, so you're a school teacher in 1972. You've got mm -hmm. these students, you're, you're married, you've got a new kid. You're walking out of court, Sixth Circuit, United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, former Justice of the Supreme Court is hearing your case, and you go down the steps of the courthouse. Was there press there? There was not. No. It did not become pressworthy press worthy until it went to the United States. And then, then it got quite press worthy. Okay, so it gets to the United States Supreme Court because there's a conflict between the circuits, the United States Court mm -hmm. of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia for the Fourth Circuit. Yes. Right? Has a ruling in a very similar case that comes out in the opposite way. Mm -hmm. And we have a conflict between the circuits which means this case goes up to the United States Supreme Court. Yes. And how did you learn that your case may get appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court? I had a meeting at my lawyer's house one day. Uh, I believe after the Sixth Circuit came out and she said, we now began a longer road. She said, your son may well be able to read this opinion before it's over. Um, but she had a kind of confidence and a sense that we're on the righteous side and we're going to get the votes that I never lost heart. Uh, she was realistic with me. She let me know this was new ground. She made no guarantees except anything that this legal team would advance the best uh, arguments it could, even though I was paying them not a dime they absorbed all of the costs, and it's expensive to appeal. And that just made me so proud and yet humbled to be part of this team that believed as strongly in the right I was trying to vindicate as they, as they did. Okay, so the Supreme Court issues a writ of cert saying we're going to take the case. Yes. Right? And at that point, you must have been getting calls from the press. Or not? I, I, was not, I was not getting calls from the press. There came a point along the way where I began to get some letters, uh, unpleasant letters, um, about, so you want to teach and be pregnant. I suppose you want to show them how you got that way too. I remember someone saying that. A woman writing me a letter saying, I have 10 children. Pregnant women should stay indoors. Outrageous things that under some circumstances might hurt your feelings. But um, I got other communications. Um, I, I forget who there is. A, I'm not Catholic, but there is a patron saint of pregnant women. And someone sent me the medal to represent the, pregnant, the, uh, the saint for pregnant women. That was very sweet. So this gained some notoriety, but as you say, the Vietnam War and other matters were clearly much more important. No, I, I forgot the word used, persistent or stubborn. Was there, was there ever a point in time where you said, you know, I don't know what I got myself into. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. Never. But that's because funding was not a concern. 
I think a lot of folks give up. They can only go so far. Um, and I had a, t a legal team that uh, said, we're, in, we're with you all the way. So your case goes to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Any more lawyers added for the Supreme Court case? No. Nope. Same lawyers? Same lawyers. And, and Jane Picker argued the case. She was accompanied by her husband, Sidney, who was a professor of law at Case Western Reserve Law School. Mm -hmm. And you were in the courtroom? I was. And tell me, tell me about, I want to hear about everything from traveling from Ohio to Washington to walking up the steps of the Supreme Court to hear the case that's going to be, uh, have your name on it. I, um, my husband and I drove from Cleveland to Washington, D.C. My mother and sister who lived in Richmond drove up so that they could attend the arguments. I had a sense of how big a deal this was becoming, mm. even though I was still a 25-year-old woman, mm -hmm. young woman. Some would say in over my head. Um, but to watch my, when they called the case, and, and you get special seating if you're one of the, the parties. Um, but to go and have a special seat reserved, to take my seat, to look up and see these men all dressed in robes, especially Justice Douglas, because I had become a fan. I had become, tried to become more knowledgeable. My husband had given me a copy of Justice Douglas's opinions, a book. Most of them were dissents. And I remember saying, oh, if Justice Douglas could only ask a question, I want him to speak. He never spoke. He had no questions. He sat there and mostly rocked. There was drama in the argument. Justice Blackman, who joined in the majority opinion in that case, by the way, posed the question to my lawyer of whether there was any real difference in a woman losing her job because she was pregnant and a man losing his job because he refused to shave his beard. And Jane put her hands on her, her waist, stuck those arms out, all five foot ten of her, and said, Mr. Justice, that analogy is ludicrous, simply ludicrous. At that, I saw her husband, Sidney, who was sitting at council table for a moment, put his hands on his head. That's my recollection. I, I believe that occurred because it was quite a dramatic moment. There was this silence. You just didn't say those kinds of things. Even I suspected to a justice. And she explained the difference. To remedy one, you have to terminate a life that's inside of you. To another, you buy an inexpensive shaver, you take off some growth, and it grows back. It, it was beautiful. And of course, I thought he was being genuine. Others afterwards said he was lobbing her a softball to give her the opportunity to really expound in a way that was quite excellent. Now, what other justices do you remember from that argument? I remember Justice Rehnquist, who uh, was the chief justice, as I remember, at that even then, who you could tell uh, was not pleased with us. He was very concerned about not just the right of an individual teacher, but how they were being asked to speak to the right of a group of, of persons that would affect millions, potentially, of women, women over the years. Um, he, and he sat in the center. He was very visible. And by his facial expressions, I could tell that he was not pleasant. I have learned that in order to win, you have to be able to count to five. And I hoped that this presentation was going to give us five votes. How did you feel coming out of the courtroom that day? You know, I felt great. Maybe I was too innocent to think that we could lose. 
I don't think, Reuben, I understood enough the politics of law, um, even the, the politics of making judicial decisions. I believed that right wins, that the righteous side wins. I, I think it uh, forgot that, um, as one of the justices has said, this is a, I remind you, this is a court of law, not a court of justice. I believed it was a court of justice and we would win. My lawyers understood it was a court of law and may have been more apprehensive. Now the argument was what, in 1973? Yes. Okay, and how many months elapsed before you got the decision? The decision came down in January of 1974. Okay, so tell me where you were when you received the news. By then, I was teaching full-time at Lakewood High School. I happened to be teaching at that moment a class on death and dying and had an invited guest speaker who was speaking about pre-planned funerals. Mm -hmm. When I was summoned, someone indicated that I had a telephone call. Now, my class knew that we had been waiting for this decision, which we thought would be coming any day, but it was a reporter on the phone, and I did not want to hear the decision from a reporter in case it had gone badly. So I immediately called my lawyer, who had been trying to get more information before she called me, and she said, we won, we won. I don't know the vote, I know we won. And it was one of the extraordinary moments of my still young life. I remember doing a grand jeté down the hall, legs up in the air. I entered my classroom hearing this solemn discussion on pre-planned funerals. And I said to the guest speaker, could I have just a moment? And he said, of course, it's your class. And I said, we won, we won. Please continue. So you were 26 years old. Yes. And you had a 7-2 victory. Yes. And at 26, you accomplished your first victory in the United States Supreme Court. Yes. Right? Before you even had a license to practice law. That's right. Right? Oh. And do you know, every day that I teach, even when I've been a law school professor, I have a quote of the day. Um, from the moment that day that the decision came down, I learned about it. The quote for every class the rest of the day was the old Vince Lombardi quote, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Um, I used to talk about, I'd used it before, how winning wasn't all that mattered. It's how you played the game. It's that you gave it your best shot. But I certainly believe that sometimes winning is the only thing. It is the highest virtue in certain cases. Now, I want to back up a little bit. Of course, if this happened today, right, the mm -hmm. decision would have been published immediately on the Supreme Court's website. Yes and your lawyers would have been able to digest the opinion and tell you everything about it within about 30 minutes. Right. right? So we're back in January of 1974. We don't have fax machines. Right. right. We don't have cell phones. That's right. There's no computers or internet, right? No copiers. No copiers. Mm -hmm. your, your briefs were typed on manual typewriters or electric typewriters? Electric typewriters. Electric typewriters. No, no, uh, no word processing. No. Right? <laughs> this is a different era of the practice of law. And, and so between the day in January of 1974, when you heard you won, how many days elapsed before you actually got a copy of the opinion? I believe it was at least two weeks before I actually got a copy of the opinion. And that was back in a time, I say back in a time because it was my time as well, it was back in a time when we didn't have Federal Express or UPS right. or overnight. So it's not like somebody could have overnighted the opinion to you, nope. right? That's right. Right? It, it was. And there was great anticipation because w my lawyers wanted the case to be decided on equal protection grounds that would have added enormously to the rights of women in a l variety of areas. As it turned out, it was a narrower uh, victory, still a victory. And tell me the name of the case. Cleveland Board of Education versus LaFleur. And Cleveland Board of Education versus LaFleur. Tell me, because of that case, what rights do pregnant women have today in this country? Because of what you've done. Well, 
the most important right was the right of public school teachers to stay on the job. The court indicated not only did it void that obligation to leave or be fired at four months of pregnancy, but it voided the post-pregnancy delay so that women and their physicians and their spouses could decide how soon after my child is born do I want to return to work. And I received a number of letters from women who were putting husbands through medical school who immediately received that benefit. And, and because again, the great majority of school districts had those regulations. Um, but it poured, they left open the possibility there could be some late date. They didn't speculate, but in fact, um, school boards didn't do that. They worked out individually with teachers when to leave. It also has had, a, had I'm told, a spillover effect into other areas where employers saw that teachers get to stay in the classroom. Huh. And what this, these, my employees are doing is, seems to be, they ought to have at least the same rights. And so informally, it was wider. Uh, in 1978, there was the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that got passed um, to, adv to further advance some of the legal rights of women, which I think, unfortunately, have plateaued along the way. Okay, so, so, you know, as they say when you win the Super Bowl, what do you do now? And they say you go to Disney World. You're 26 years old. You win the Supreme Court case. What do you do now? You go to law school. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell me about that. Well, one of the things, Ruben, I saw was that in a moment in time, if you can have the intersection of a determined plaintiff who has been wronged, um, meeting up with a lawyer who is willing to take on a cause, even a long expensive cause, and especially when you can't pay your lawyer, that great things are, ha are, are possible and that an individual has the possibility in some circumstances to make a difference not only in your own life, but in others who are situation, situated in places like you, that rights can be vindicated if those folks can come together. And so when did you go to law school? Um, the decision came down again in 74. I began fall classes that year in the fall of 1974 at Cleveland State Law School. I still wanted to dip my toe in legal education. Um, my lawyer had been very encouraging. She said, Joe Carroll, you seem to understand all of this. You're really invested. You see what lawyers can do. So I taught high school during the day. My son was two years old. I went to law school three nights a week, and after the first year, it was clear that I really wanted to pursue uh, the legal education and transfer to the University of Utah, where I graduated in, in December of 1977. And you've been practicing law since 1977? Yes. And now you practice and you teach? I do. And tell me about the teaching part. You know, the teaching is so important. I think I've always been a teacher at heart. I have taught full time at a local law school for several years, teaching evidence in criminal law and ethics and trial advocacy. I've taught at another law school as an adjunct, teaching trial ad and interviewing counseling. And one of the things that I find most satisfying is to, because I've taught in a law school where some of the students or like me as law students, they're in other careers and they want to see if this is what they want to do, is to help the students that I teach find their own voice in the law, a place that meets whatever their need is as a human being. I particularly encourage them, and in my classes and professional responsibility, focus on my hope that they will engage in pro bono lawyering, which is about the highest kind of lawyering. I am the beneficiary of a pro bono lawyer. And when I teach here at the uh, trial advocacy program, as I have since 1996, I always take um, uh, moments at the end, on the last day, 
to encourage those highly skilled students in the Emory program to always include pro bono clients in whatever practice they do. Because one of the things I've learned is that while all lawyers can do many things and some focus on transactional or non-litigation, sometimes a right can only be vindicated by a lawyer who's willing to file a complaint, walk through the courthouse door, conduct a trial, and make those arguments. So we have a need for trial lawyers, and trial lawyers who will do pro bono cases. I'm clearly not the only person, and not, this wasn't the only right, waiting to be vindicated by some lawyer. And there's no reason why it can't be one of the lawyers, one of the young lawyers who attends this program. Well, Joe Cowell, you're in your, what, 17th year teaching at the Emory's uh, Kessler Eidson and Trial Techniques program? With a two or three that were missed along the way, but at least 15, yes. Well, it's been wonderful having you in the program. Well, thank you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure, Ruben.